Five Year Mission, the podcast, episode 20. This episode of Five Year Mission, the podcast, is brought to you by Fansets, your home for all things pop culture pin related. Head over to fansets.com and see all that they have to offer. And also stay tuned at the end of the episode for a very special offer from us here at Five Year Mission. By now, you figured out that this is the Five Year Mission podcast. <laughs> Welcome to Five Year Mission, the podcast, the only podcast that's hosted by a Star Trek band. <laughs> so we have some very, very special guests tonight. I am, of course, joined by Mr. Mike Rittenhouse as per usual. Hi. Hi, Mike. Hi, Andy. Don't sound so enthused. <laughs> <laughs> so we have two very special guests tonight. Uh, we are super excited to have them. You know them from Star Trek, The Next Generation and on. You know them from movies such as The Informant, Sully. Uh, mo more recently, Netflix's Space Force starring Steve Carell and now Star Trek's Tawny Newsom, And also their most current project, Apple TV's For All Mankind. Our guests tonight are of course, the ones, the onlys. I had to pluralize it because there's two. Mike and Denise Okuda, otherwise known as the Okudas. Hi. Hi there. <laughs> How you guys doing? Well, we're good. We're good. We're, we're happy to be here, trying to survive the pandemic just like everybody else. No, yeah. trust me, we've been we, we we've been in on that ourselves. We've been we haven't we haven't played a show since February, so we're going crazy. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, we we can't even have band practice. No, yeah, singing, singing, yeah, yeah shouting, that makes, yeah, that makes that's sense. not good. That's yeah. Good. Well, for all spit flying around. Yeah, yeah, exactly. For all mankind, shut down production in uh, in in mid March, and with some luck, they they may actually be starting up again. Oh, wow! Oh, yeah, finally. Yeah, really. So I know there's a, there's a lot of productions that have been put on hold because of all this. Most all uh, yeah, I was going to say almost all productions. Uh, everything went down. Hollywood shut down like in days. It was just dead. <sighs> Yeah, it was like overnight, right? Yeah, practically, right. pretty practically, much, yeah. almost overnight, mm. and um, and then it was, of course, out into the unknown, just like everyone. Yeah. And we've been just kind of waiting, and now that we're going back, it's just totally different. I yeah. mean, it's filmmaking is such a strange craft because you have so many different kinds of people interacting in so many different ways in very close quarters for very long hours. Uh, you, you have makeup artists and actors' faces. You have directors mm -hmm. and script supervisors and us huddled around a teeny little video monitor. You have lighting people zipping in and out. You have prop people doing uh, doing a, a thousand and one little last-minute changes. You have construction people. You have the art department. You've got sound people. It's, it's nuts. So to figure out how can you do that safely has been the challenge that Every studio has, has been uh, trying to wrap their brain around for months. Months. <laughs> Even if everyone wears a mask, it's still, I mean, this is way too much risk. So there's, there's a lot of risk and there's a lot of, uh, and, and of course, uh, when you're on camera, the actors can't wear uh, uh, we're masks. Right. Well, yeah. uh, in our show, they can wear spacesuits. So that's, that's a, <laughs> a nice, nice little work around. Yeah, I've, I've actually seen a, a few live photos and videos of like the actors on stage wearing like full face shields and everything with the microphones like stuck up under them and everything. And it's 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 the weirdest thing I think I've ever seen. It's like if if nothing says 2020 more than people acting out or doing a musical on stage in full face shields. <laughs> I don't, yeah. I don't, and, oh, it's, and it, 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 it's not even like pandemic related. They were doing like a, like a something, it's like a beef and boards, like a dinner theater thing. And they were doing Oklahoma. Yeah. <laughs> Oklahoma with face shields. I love it. <laughs> yeah. I guess, I, I guess maybe to, to, to prevent dysentery. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> many, many years ago, I worked on a, on a college production of Oklahoma. Oh yeah. Where the, where the wind comes whipping through the plains. Yeah, fortunately, I didn't sing, but uh, <laughs> oh, come on! We can we go. We, no, we can always make that happen next next time we see you guys in person. Uh, uh, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> so let's get to some actual questions. 
Um, th th now, th we know about the work you've done, design work and everything for Star Trek and everything. Um, what was your background leading up to like getting the jet, getting like work to work on Star Trek? Like, what did you do before Star Trek? Uh, before Star Trek, I was uh, I was working as a graphic artist at a major medical center in Honolulu, and at the same time, I was moonlighting doing ultra low budget uh, mechanical effects uh, for television commercials for very low budget television commercials, and, uh, and 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 doing doing some community theater work. And you think community theater? Hollywood, two different animals, and it's not. It's it's just it's two different points in the same continuum. So they uh, it, it it transferred better better than you think. Yeah, I, I I I always hear about a lot of people with theater backgrounds, kind of like trying to transition over, but then there's always like a few little hiccups here and there. But you know, otherwise it's oh, sure. fairly standard. Well, the uh, the the thought process processes are the same. Oh, you know, the, some of the techniques are different. Certainly, the budgets are uh, are different, expectations different. But how do you wrap your brain around the problem of how do I tell this story? How do you use? Uh, how, how do you make a set uh, uh, practical for uh, for these production needs? It's it's the same same basic mindset. Yeah. How about you, Denise? I came from a totally different universe. I um, actually was working as a registered nurse before I met Michael. And um, if I wanted to see him on the weekends, I would go up to Paramount and basically just took class from him <laughs> and uh, worked a little bit more until I was working uh, and as a production assistant eventually and was then um, hired by our production designer, uh, Herman Zimmerman. So I kind of went in the side door, so to speak, mm -hmm. and from the, just kept working on Star Trek for that. So I, I was in a very different world than, than uh, television making. Yeah. Wow. So you already knew each other by the time you got into working on Star Trek? Yeah, yeah basically. How, how did you two meet? Just through mutual friends. And uh, I had come up to the studio and... Yeah. Uh, Denise was doing some consulting for our production designer on on medical things. Oh. Uh, one one day she walks back uh, by my desk, and I was a big fan of the 1980s television series Max Headroom. Oh, uh, me too. Very, Ooh, uh, yeah. Very, very cool show. I had a little little Max Headroom maquette, little 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 puppet head that I had pinned to my bulletin board uh, at um, uh, in, in the art department. Denise walks by and says. Who's is that? Yeah, I was a big, <laughs> big fan of Max Headroom. It was a brilliant show. So, so the real answer to your question is uh, of uh, uh, who introduced us. Uh, it was Max Headroom. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> was your first major production uh, the, the Next Generation then for, for for you two like collaborating and working together? Uh, we worked a little together on Next Generation. Certainly, she she helped out in the in the evenings. But our first uh, uh, Star Trek. Six, five or six, five or six, yeah, and and then, and Deep, then Space. Deep Space Nine, yeah, that was the order, I think. Okay, okay. Um, because we were working seven days a week, it was it was nice to be able to um, be at work, but also be at home, and we were both on the same wavelength, which was lovely. We were both exhausted, <laughs> so. Um, uh, but it was also nice, you know, to have your friend. Uh, by your side to hold you up and we would hold each other up when we were just so absolutely exhausted. Um, Some daughter pizza with. See, oh my God, <laughs> it's almost every night. Um, people, you know, especially pre-production, you know, people would leave and we'd be there, you know, uh, putting signage up on the sets or, or whatever. Gelling graphics. Gelling graphics, um, uh, backlit graphics. I mean, long, long hours. Um, we would order pizza, like I said, almost every night. I, in fact, when we were done with, I guess Star Trek Six, Six. was when we were. Um, I couldn't eat pizza for years. Years. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so tired of it. I don't, think, oh, I, don't, I don't think I could ever do that. Here's a um, here's a fun fact. The very first meal or the very first food that was ever taken in Ten Forward was pizza yes michael and i were working on the weekend i think on the set and we ordered food and we ate it in 10 forward 
Nice. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Another another pizza story. There was a um, <laughs> there was a uh, little pizza restaurant in, in Burbank that dates back to the fifties or the sixties. Sadly, it's no longer there. It's called uh, um, Tony's Bella Vista, and uh, we used to love going there because uh, uh, great pizza. And uh, we'd often go there with uh, uh, Doug Drexler and, and Dorothy Duder. Uh, one day, uh, we went there with, uh, with Matt Jeffries, uh, Matt Jeffries and his wife, Marianne. Matt Jeffries, of course, being the production designer who, mm -hmm. uh, who designed the original Enterprise, the, the quiet, gentle genius who's res responsible for the Starship Enterprise. And uh, they, they, they sat us at, a, at, a, at the round table in the corner and what we didn't know is that that was Matt's favorite restaurant and that was Matt's favorite table. So, and he sat there and he sat there during the, the original series. So that, wow. that place got quite a history. Awesome. Yeah. So now, so, so now being that, being that you guys have actually worked with Matt Jeffries, do you have any insight as to what we can do about all these exploding panels on the enterprise? Matt understood that, uh, you, your job isn't to design a starship. Your job, is to, your job is to create uh, incredible tools that help you tell the story. And right. if the director and the producers want the panels to explode, you figure out how to make them explode. And that's... <laughs> if, you, if you look at Star Trek The Next Generation, mm -hmm. uh, there was a lot more thought at the beginning of it uh, than there could have ever been at the beginning of, of the original series, simply because there was there was already a Star Trek to uh, to compare it to, mm -hmm. and so uh, Gene and, uh, and 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 his staff were trying very hard to pay homage to what was done before, but were also trying to to do new things or to or to learn from what was done before. And one of the things they decided was uh, there they were sensitive to the criticism that the panels are always exploding. <laughs> so they said, okay, we're going to be more realistic now. Uh, uh, when, when systems go down, the, the, they're going to lose power, but we're not going to explode the panels. And you go, oh, okay. Yeah. And so for the first about three, two and a half seasons, there are relatively few exploding panels because uh, that was Gene's edict and we're, 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 we're doing what Gene said. Mm -hmm. And so we did one episode where uh, I think it was yesterday's enterprise. It might've been yesterday's yeah. enterprise where suddenly boom. And suddenly all the new directors who, uh, who had who were part of next generation who didn't really know the original Star Trek went, wow, that adds a lot of excitement. That's uh, that adds <laughs> a lot of visual energy. And suddenly whatever circuit breakers were built into this, to the starship, suddenly got taped shut in. Boom, we, we, we had panels exploding all over the place. <laughs> Everything just went haywire. The Enterprise went down in generations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so the whole bloody thing caught on fire. So, <laughs> and, and then from that point, as time went on, we had more and more exploding panels and you just go, okay. I mean, it's, 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 it's gotta be a pity to, to, to see your beautiful Elkar system get blown up so many times. The backlit panels on Star Trek Next Generation, they're not, print, they're not actually my idea of what would the 24th century look like. Mm -hmm. I went through, uh, at, the, at the very beginning of Next Generation, I, I, went, I, I, did, I went through a, a thought process and I said, uh, knowing that television is always, uh, always schedule-wise under the gun, knowing that you're always under budget, knowing that there's always last minute, minute requests, knowing that the night before the, the, the art director is going to say, can we put a panel there? Always happen. <laughs> so the question was, if you're going to make a control panel, what is the most efficient, least expensive de uh, decision you can make at every step of the process? And for example, uh, if you're making control panels with toggle switches, you got to buy the toggle switches, you got to drill holes, you got to mount them in. It's very, it's very labor intensive. It's, it looks cool. And then you, you might have to wire it up and maybe you have to put little blinkies in it. And suddenly you're talking about at least a week lead time to add, to add a control panel. And the cost per square foot just to buy this toggle switches is very high. By contrast, you have a control panel system that's based purely on graphics. It's fast, it's, it's inexpensive, and it looks different. So 
you take you take that style and you say, okay, how now that I have those decisions made, how can I make that look good? How can I make that look interesting? How can I make that look credible? And what we ended up with is, is what we call uh, L cars today, and it was a it was a uh, an interesting design challenge, but it started in a different place than uh, than than the average viewer might reasonably think, because it, it, it was a solution to a uh, to a, a lot of rather complex production decisions. And the reason I, I I spent all the time explaining that to you is, therefore, when a panel explodes, it's relatively fast and relatively uh, uh, easy to replace it. Right. Yeah, I, I was. I, I always noticed that. There's a, like they. I always noticed that the, the engineering could probably get those panels replaced pretty quickly with the way they were. Yeah, yeah. The back panels on the bridge, because they had that curved plexiglass, were were uh, were harder to get at, and also they they had this they had this elaborate lighting system in them. But but a lot of them were uh, cut another piece of plex, make another graphic, uh, throw it in, throw it in there, and we would often replace the graphics on a lot of consoles almost every year with, uh, just because they, they, they start to peel a little, a little bit, they start to fade a little bit. So, but, uh, but again, once you have the art, it's, uh, it's relatively inexpensive and, and fairly fast to, uh, to replace. You know, one thing one thing I'm currently impressed with is with uh, with with uh, with Star Trek Lower Decks right now, seeing the in an animated version of the Elcar system, and I think it looks amazing. I think they did a great job of of, of capturing the uh, of capturing the style, and and again, that's that's harder than it looks because we uh, in live action you can have an almost infinite amount of detail, and then the camera will mm. resolve what it what it wants to. In animation, you have to decide what are you going to show and what are you just going to let turn in, into into fuzz. Right. They had a, a, a single graphic designer. I I don't remember her name, uh, uh, and, and and I apologize to you if if, if you're if you're listening, but I uh, but I th I think she I think she did a great job of uh, of of capturing the style. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I really enjoyed the first episode of Lower Decks. is is a lot of fun. It felt a lot like the the '90s Trek. So I enjoyed the second episode too. Oh, you, I haven't you, seen it you, yet. I've only seen half of the I've only seen half of the second episode. Okay. <laughs> well, we, because we, we really like the people making it too. They're really nice, fun people, and they love Star Trek, and they wanted to get it right. Yeah. And uh, we went in, I don't know, it was January. It was pre, it was pre pandemic. Um, and, <laughs> Just barely. Uh, we invited I, actually, it was last October. No, really? Last October. Oh my God. I have no sense of time. <laughs> they, they asked us to come on over and, and just chat with them. And we had a delightful time. We enjoyed their company and their creativity. And, uh, and uh, we and, wish them well. Yeah. And you could tell from the very first moment these are people who like Star Trek. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. Uh, the 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 guys uh, the guys from Trek Geeks just yesterday uh, had to, got to, got to interview uh, uh, Mike McMahon, uh -huh. mm -hmm. which you know, he seems like a big star big Star Trek fan, and I he absolutely I'm glad, I'm absolutely. glad he's part of the family. He yeah. absolutely is. We met Michael McMahon last year at the uh, at the Vegas Star Trek convention. Yeah. And yeah, he introduced himself, and we said, "Oh, hello!" You know, trying try, try, trying to be polite. And then, then he told us, which I had not realized, that he used to run uh, on Twitter. There was a uh, there was a Twitter account called TNG Season Eight, mm -hmm. and, and they would uh, periodically post these uh, uh, TV Guide style uh, synopses of 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 fake episodes from Season Eight, and and there and there always silly but well informed it was like someone mm -hmm. knows star trek yeah. and, and found the humor in uh, in the absurdity of star trek and you can see that same thought process in uh, in lower decks yeah absolutely and then if, if I, i'm really glad that they actually have uh, people voicing the characters too that are actually trekkies because because I, I know to like, to like tawny newsom I know she. I know she. She was a Trekkie before all this. Yeah, I didn't and, I know that. Yeah, yeah. she's she, because I, I. I've been following her for a while because I've been a fan of hers because of the uh, because of the, the Paul F. Tompkins podcast, Spontaneous Nation, and she was always a guest. And she also has a podcast called a, called a, called a, 
yo, is this racist? Oh. And it's, it's wonderful. And so I've been a fan of hers for a while. And so then they have like Jerry O'Connell is one of the voices. And I know he's a big Trekkie and his wife is also number one. She, she's going to be on strange new worlds now. So it's, it's just kind of keeping it all in the family. We've never met Ms. Newsom, but, uh, uh, we actually worked with her on, uh, uh, she was the helicopter pilot in, um, Space Force. Yeah. Now, did you, did, did you guys do all, all the graphics that were in like the control room in Space Force? Most of them, uh, what happened was, uh, uh, the supervising video engineer, uh, uh, Ben Betts, uh, we had worked with him on, um, on Voyager and Enterprise. And mm -hmm. so he said, Hey, would you, uh, uh you want to help out? And we said, of course, you know, We'd love, love to do, love to do this big stuff. And we said, the, the one caveat is uh, we're, we're working on For All Mankind. So when they ramp up, uh, uh, you know, th that's got to be our priority. So we helped them launch the show. We, we did the, uh, the basic style for Mission Control. And we did some stuff for, for some of the early episodes. But then second season uh, For All Mankind was, uh, got hot and heavy. And so from that point on, we only able to make minor contributions. Okay. So basically you just, you just went in and like laid the groundwork and you're like, see ya, we're here on your end now. Yeah. <laughs> well, although uh, we did a ton of stuff for the last episode, which uh, I, I don't think we saw very much of. Uh, we, we did a lot more stuff for that than, uh, than, than ended up on the, on the air. I've only seen the last episode once. Okay. It was a it's a it's a great series, and I'm I, I'm I'm hoping that so that season two will get, get to start get to start shooting pretty soon. A space for us. I really enjoyed the first season. Yeah, absolutely. And then I say they have, they have a great cast too. They have an they amazing have an cast. amazing cast. Yeah, that's a some some, some, some pretty heavy hitters in that cast. I mean, Very between Steve, Steve Carell, Tony Newsom, uh, John Malkovich. Oh, not yeah. yeah. He's yeah, he, to me he's the he's the breakout star. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> for the breakout as character. the as the nerd. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> now, with with all your graphic work, I know uh, there's I know one major Easter egg you guys got to do on Voyager on a on a on, on Seven and Nine's pad. You had some had to have some West Wing wing references on there. You're talking about the uh, there was a. Uh, it, w it wasn't on Seven Nine's pad. It was in the uh, uh, in Astrometrics, I think. Oh, okay. There, there was a uh, there was a list of crew members who had died. Mm -hmm. and, um, actually, that that was done by uh, by our good friend uh, uh, Jim Vanover Senior, who did a lot of a lot of uh, our our screen animation, and Jim loves West Wing as as much as we do. <laughs> uh, I, I made him change the spelling so that the the, uh, the the names weren't exactly uh, <laughs> West Wing characters. So, yeah, yeah we, we 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 killed Josiah Bartlett and uh, and and all those people. <laughs> <laughs> now, have, have, have you guys ever had ever had a chance to sneak in any other weird little Easter eggs like that at all? Well, uh, let's see. until Enterprise. Yeah, once Enterprise happened. Yeah, that was high def. So. Mm. We had to be very careful. Yeah, you know, because you can read, you can read that stuff on camera, and the, yeah. the inside jokes were never really meant to be public. They were there for the entertainment of the crew, and mm. right. um, and I and our entertainment. You know, I mean, yeah. If you if the if the casual viewer uh, notices it, but catches the casual viewer's eye, you've done a large disservice to the to the show. And to the mm -hmm. audience, because you you're disrupting the storytelling. Yeah. One nameless person who used to work for me uh, didn't understand that in in the episode in Next Generation episode. Um, uh, the, the the ghost. No, I know exactly what you yeah. mean. I can't remember uh, the Sub-Rosa? Sub-Rosa. Thank Sub you. Sub we we blocked it out of our minds. <laughs> <laughs> and we like you should. Them, there was a graveyard. And you know it, it's it's okay if you put uh, uh, names of your coworkers and friends and, and, right. and on on the tombstones, uh, you know as long as you just you don't you don't make them catch uh, so they catch the eye. Mm -hmm. This unnamed person put 
McFly and Vader in it and large type. You can see it. And I you mean, can see it. And again, that's a serious disservice to the to the episode. Because if it catches you, if it catches your eye, you're you're taking it right out of that story. Mm-hmm. Which in this well, case, but it's, that's a bad thing. Look, luckily, that's not the only thing in the episode that takes you out of it. <laughs> but, <laughs> the finest. But you know, in Space Force, we put a lot of things that are this big in in the uh, graphics and mission control, and you know, hopefully, you'll 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 never see it. <laughs> Well, who knows? There's a there's a lot of eagle-eyed fans on on Twitter, so I'm sure they're probably stopping every single frame and z- oh. enhancing. Yeah, that's why it was so different back back in the in the '90s, the '80s, and the '90s. Um, you know, people didn't have that ability, and mm. so many things went through that nobody read, nobody picked up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when when we remastered Star Trek: The Next Generation a few years ago at at CBS. Uh, a lot of the graphics were generated. Uh, a lot of a lot of the uh, animation graphics that you put in in post production had been generated in formats that no longer existed. So uh, I ended up having to recreate a bunch of that stuff, trying to make it look as much like the original as possible. Oh wow! Wow! Not everything. Uh, some things existed on film, and and they and mm-hmm. those. But there were there were a few shots where there were jokes that, that suddenly became more visible than you wanted them to be. Mm-hmm. So you're kind of walking that tightrope. If uh, You know that some fans are aware of it, so you don't want to get rid of them, but you, don't, you never want them to, uh, to draw the fans, uh, the viewers' attention. So in some cases, I made them a little smaller or uh, made mm-hmm. them a little less obvious. So, but, but if you knew about it and you were going back to look for it, you'd still find it. <laughs> so uh speaking of the remastered um the next gen and the original series uh w- how, how did that come to be um because I, I know you had you had to do a lot of uh work on the tri- trials and tribulations how did the remastered original series come to be a thing when we did trials and tribulations one of the things that Gary Hutzel did, uh, the uh, late great visual effects supervisor, is he went back to the original uh, camera negative and rescanned it. And as, as an experiment, he rescanned some shots in standard def, in high def, uh, 4K, and 8K. And even the standard def rescan, because the bit depth is greater, uh, we were stunned at how much uh, how much more vibrant the colors were, but in in HD, you could uh, you could see coffee stains on ne- on Nimoy's, Nimoy's <laughs> tunic. That was that was shocking. <laughs> so, uh, fast forward to around 2006, Dave Rossi and a bunch of uh, people from CBS approached us and said, "Would you be interested in working on this?" and we understood that uh, forgetting the visual, setting the visual effects aside for, uh, for the moment, the original Star Trek, like most of the Star Treks, were shot in 35 millimeter film, which is inherently high def, which is mm-hmm. beautiful, saturated, detailed colors, uh-huh. gorgeous lighting, a lot of which is lost when you transfer to video. So suddenly you can bring it back and, uh, and our friends, uh, Ryan Adams and uh, Dave Grant and uh, Phil Bishop and um, uh, Deep Deep David David LaFontaine put a lot of work into bringing that show, and it was such a treat because you know we we had seen the show on television for uh, for literally decades, and we had, we we bought the laser discs and the VHS, and we uh-huh. bought on on DVD. But suddenly, this show just came alive. So we. Uh, we, 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 were, we were just thrilled. It had to be pretty wild to see details that you had never even seen before in a show that you've seen so many times. Yeah, it, I mean, we've seen Star Trek episodes so many times with so many different hats on, um, rarely for pure entertainment, but it, because we, we wrote a couple of books and we just had to really dissect the 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 episodes um but when we saw these beautiful prints i mean they were they were just gorgeous but you saw things you just never saw we saw coffee stains on the bridge floor uh, and on <laughs> and on nimoy's tunic you could see the makeup uh especially the earlier episodes on on 
um, Leonard's ears. The, the, oh, the yeah. funding just wasn't very good. But you could also see uh, gorgeous detailing in the uh, in, in the uh, in, in the costumes and in the, in the fabric yeah. in the mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. as quickly and as cheaply as they had to make those things. They're just gorgeous. Yeah, yeah. We have a lot of respect for the for the uh, for the folks that made the original series, having worked on you know future Star Trek incarnations um, yeah. that had more technology. You know, they were they were making shows, six day shows, um, really long hours, hot, hot lights, yeah. lots of, you know, thick makeup because of the, the lighting and mm -hmm. uh, just a lot, a lot of. Um, a lot of sheer, sheer genius, a lot yeah. of ingenuity. Yeah. Yeah. They didn't have a lot of money. No, they didn't have a lot of money, so. Oh yeah, that, 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 yeah, that, that budget just kept on shrinking, shrinking throughout those throughout yeah. three seasons. It did. <laughs> Star Trek, the original Star Trek itself, I don't think a lot of people realize how, how brilliant the, that conce conception was. Gene understood that he was making a, uh, a television show that, that, that did not have the budget of a science fiction movie. He had to make it a, uh, um, uh, budget uh, a show basically with the same kind of budget that you did for uh uh for an hour-long cop show back then mm -hmm. right so how do you tell the story uh, how do you show a story about the vastness of the cosmos about about a group of people going to a different planet every week with a tiny budget and limited resources mm -hmm. well one thing you do is you choose where to spend your money Roddenberry spent a lot of money on the Enterprise Bridge. Oh, yeah. uh, it was the most expensive single set they had, but they shot pretty much half the entire show on that set. Yeah. So every every dime you spend on that uh, uh, helped the overall look of the show. And then and then he had a uh, he had some standing sets, the, the corridors, the sick bay, uh, captain's quarters. And those were more cheaply made, but you still saw them, saw them a lot. Mm -hmm. And you actually saw relatively little of the planets you went to visit. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and, when you, and when you start, when you, start thinking about it. Yeah, and when you did, it looked suspiciously like uh, uh, the studio back lot. The aliens mm -hmm. looked suspiciously like people with very minor makeup changes. <laughs> or maybe. And, and yet the strength of the storytelling, the strength of the writing was such that it was the ideas. It was it, it was the it was the morality play, and and Roddenberry and Gene Kuhn and Dorothy Fontana and Bob, Bob Justman, Justman, they pulled it off. Yeah. If I had a hat, I'd take it off to them. <laughs> Speaking of which, um, with you guys doing like the, the 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 remasters and everything like that, you guys also did tireless countless uh, countless hours months and years of work on on the Roddenberry vault could you could, could you could, uh, could, could you tell us about like how crazy that had to have driven you crazy it was crazy <laughs> but it was a it was a passion project and it was the most fun we i think i can speak for michael it was the most fun it was the best project we ever worked on it was so much work you have no idea yeah because because when you guys initially got the got kind of the call to to to, to work and work on this roddenberry vault it was literally like a warehouse that it, that, that was wasn't it wasn't it rod that inv invited you guys and had you sign like an nda and everything yes yeah, yeah. uh rod roddenberry and and, and his uh, business partner trevor roth uh, okay invited us to uh uh to look at what they had. And it was not a full warehouse, but hundreds and hundreds of reels of film. Just, I mean, sizes like this, like this. And almost wow. none of it had, had been seen since the production of the, of the original series. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of questions. On one hand, those of us who are Star Trek fans are, this is astonishingly cool. Because uh, most Star Trek fans uh, who, who like the original series have seen the episodes enough that if you see, if they use take four and you see take three, Nimoy is a different inflection. That's cool. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But the uh, uh, CBS had legitimate questions. 
questionable. How do you present this to the fans in a way that's interesting to more than, than 25 people? Mm -hmm. that, that was a real challenge. So uh, Phil Bishop turned to uh, 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 our friend producer, Roger Lay, uh, mm -hmm. Roger Lay Jr., who said, let's build some documentaries around them so we can use the footage uh, and then, and then, and then for, for context, we'll, we'll show the episodes themselves. So you can, so you can see, oh, this is how it was in the episode. This, this is the, this is the new thing. <laughs> and it became a huge project before, before any of this could happen. We had to catalog it all. What, and what they did is they had to hire somebody that would be able to sync up sound and film at the same time, telecine it down to um, uh, DVDs. They were sent to our house. So what we would do is it would arrive to the house, we would sit down and we would just watch it. Just watch it straight through. But were you taking like notes and everything on the first watch? Very, the very first time we watched it, it was purely as an entertainment. And okay. it was astonishing. I mean, we know Star Trek, very, the original series, very, very, very well. And mm -hmm. I, for whatever, I used to, back in the day, I audio recorded it. Um, actually, my dad audio, I was pretty little, so my dad audio recorded it and I would listen to it um, on seven inch reel to reel tape. Oh, wow. And so I had the bloody episodes memorized. Wow. And that just, I mean, you think about it, it just, uh, then from there, I you know, would watch it on TV when it went into syndication and mm -hmm. I loved it. And then we started working on, the different incarnations. And then we started doing the book so that we would watch it again and again and put it under a microscope. So I know the dialogue really, really well. And I can tell take three from take four wow. on episodes, which was a huge time saver because very rarely did we have to go look it up. I knew it. True. And so, um, from there, we would listen to it, and then we would start the work. And the work took this took several years. Several, was it was it um, was it three years? I, I was we, trying we, to remember we, how. We, uh, it took about a, it took a couple of years, not full not time. Not full time, because mm -hmm. we had other jobs. And <laughs> right. so the secret code name for the project was Sargon. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> And when we, when we finished it, and like I said, this was more work than anything that we've ever, ever done. And, um, and then we couldn't tell anybody either. I mean, yeah. we, we couldn't tell anybody. It was a secret for all these years, and we were so damn excited. Um, there were a couple of times we came off the couch. I don't know if you've seen the Roddenberry Vault. Oh, there, yeah. Oh, a yeah. couple of scenes from um, uh, Operation Annihilate. Operation Annihilate um, City, oh. City yeah. on the Edge of Forever. Mike and I came off. Yeah, when the couch. The, the, like the, 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 the whole like extended scene with it with with Kirk and Edith on the stoop. Yes. yes. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Oh, I mean, when, we just when we saw that we uh, we paused and we we got on the phone and we called Phil, who was uh, a VP at at CBS, and we said we just found this amazing stuff. Yeah. And, you know, Phil has an enormous respect for Star Trek. He, he understood that he understands that it's, it's important, that it's important to get it right. He doesn't really know Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> he knows enough to treat it right. And he right. knew enough to respect our passion. But when we mm -hmm. got excited, he, he got, got excited. excited. And um, That's there, always were, so good. there were two things that we were looking, we're looking for specifically well three things we knew that the footage or the the stills of peter kirk existed because we'd seen them oh on the bridge from operation annihilate yes yeah. with him in the, in the uniform uh -huh. um with uh and that we found oh. we found we found um in the episode who mourns for Ad uh, adonias yeah. okay that's mm -hmm. the other one there is uh we knew that there had been written a scene uh, a, um, 
a tag scene at the end of the episode with McCoy coming under the bridge telling us that Carolyn Palamas is pregnant. We didn't know if it was shot. So uh, we, had inter- we had interviewed uh, Leslie Parrish and she told us they in fact had, uh, had shot, the, uh, shot the scene. Wow. So we're going, and, and we talked to um, Mike Forrest as well. So we mm-hmm. said, wouldn't it be amazing if we could find that footage? We didn't actually find the footage. But what we did find is we found a shot of Spock on the bridge from that scene. And off camera, you can hear the script supervisor reading McCoy's lines. So it was filmed. We did hear it. it we, we didn't get to see you know, the whole thing. It wasn't there. Right. I mean, you've got to remember, this footage ended up on the cutting room floor. This, yeah. These were takes that they didn't use. Right. And so um, there were some episodes that were almost nothing. We almost got nothing. And then there were other episodes that were just endless um, battlefield and um, who mourns for and yeah, um, there, there is a, a um, wolf in the fold. There are endless takes of uh, of um, car dancing, car uh, dancing, which <laughs> oh wow, yeah. But anyway, it, it 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 was an amazing project, and on top of all this great, wonderful hidden gems of footage that nobody had seen in forever really but um that was and you were like a fly on the wall in the episode uh uh conscience of the king uh uh uhura sings sings this uh uh sings a love song to uh uh, uh to riley oh yeah 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 but the way it's cut is you see Nichelle at the beginning of the of the uh, uh of the song then the rest of it plays out watching watching Kevin watching or uh, listening to the song. And we only cut back to her at the end. We found the entire song and we found a, uh, we found a verse that was cut out of the, uh, uh, actually cut out of the episode. Oh, wow. So we, we could, you know, we, we, we rebuilt it. We rebuilt that sequence and, and put, put it in there. We could talk about this for hours because <laughs> we're so passionate about the project. I'm, I, I just always, I just, always hoped that Star Trek fans would purchase the, the Blu-ray and mm-hmm. watch it because we really did it for, for people like us yeah. that yeah. passionately love Star Trek. And um, it was the hardest we've ever worked, I think, on any project. But it was just, it, we were on a mission. Yeah, it was a privilege. Yeah. There's, if, you, if you've seen the episode, The Menagerie, mm-hmm. the, the, the shots of the shuttlecraft flying, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the optical effects processes that they used to use required footage to be re-photographed and re-photographed. And each time you lose detail, each, each time it gets a little harder to see. Mm-hmm. If you look very carefully at the shuttlecraft in the original version of the Menagerie, the unremastered version, mm-hmm. look at the, at the markings on the side of the shuttle. They're, they're entirely different from what, what we're used to, because that was, in fact, the very first time the shuttlecraft was seen on Star Trek. So the, the model hadn't been finalized yet. And it's not too obvious because the, the picture is really grainy and it's, uh, and it's, it's not... Uh, uh, you, you really can't see what you're looking at. Uh-huh. Once you realize it's different, you go, what are those graphics? <laughs> well, we found, uh, going through material for the Roddenberry Vault, we found clear first-generation footage of the original version of the shuttlecraft mo- model with entirely different markings. And to, uh, if you're a spaceship geek like I am, it's, uh, this, this, is, uh, this is a big wow moment. So yeah. we, we made sure to include that. It's on, it's on disc three someplace. That, anyway, so cool. we, could t- we could talk about this for hours because <laughs> it just it just blows our mind that we even got to do it. Yeah, I bet. Now, we just, we, we just talked about the Roddenberry Vault. The other big project you guys, you guys worked on was, that, was, uh, was, Star, was the Star Trek Encyclopedia. Now, do you guys have any plans to add any volumes to that? Absolutely no. not. No. <laughs> the encyclopedia was, was not fun. <laughs> was was another project which was disproportionately labor heavy. Yeah, I'm sure. And 
Uh, we were very proud of the encyclopedia. We were always disappointed that we never got to finish Voyager and Enterprise. Yeah. So the, the, the previous last edition was 1999. So in, uh, uh, I guess around 2014, mm -hmm. uh, when we were approached uh, to do it again, we ran the math, figured it, figured it out and said, this is a terrible business proposition for us because <laughs> the, the, the amount of hours it'll take versus the amount of money will be paid. Mm -hmm. It really would make a lot more sense to work at McDonald's. <laughs> it would have made a great deal more money. But at the same time, we're proud of the book and we're going, oh, okay. Well. We wanted to finish it up. I mean, it was the, you know, it was the last, I think we did do two Abrams films. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, we, you know, I don't think, dis no, Discovery hadn't had, had, started just, yet. And no. They uh, were, Beyond hadn't come out yet. Beyond hadn't come out, and the Abrams camp were very stingy about giving out anything, so we didn't include it. We were, we were at least able to get the uh, uh, the scripts for uh, Star Trek 2009 and, uh, and Into Darkness, so we were, mm -hmm. able, to, were able to include it. Uh, one of the wackiest challenges of doing that, because we knew we wanted to include the Abrams films, mm -hmm. the problem is since the Star Trek Encyclopedia is theoretically a book from the Star Trek universe, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, you, you can refer to an alternate timeline there. But what do you call the timeline? In, uh, in a, a scholar in the Star Trek universe refers to the mirror universe. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you call the Abrams timeline? Uh, Abrams doesn't exist in, in, in that timeline. Right. Right. So, so, so what do you call it? Uh, our first instinct was to call it was to find out what the name of the star was that exploded in, at the uh, beginning uh, in the first film that triggered all the events. Right. Watch the whole film, check the, went through the script. There's no name for There's it. There's no name for it. <laughs> so we called uh, John Van at CBS, uh, <clears throat> uh, at CBS and said, what's the name of the star? He didn't know. He checked with, uh, uh, with his friends at the, at the Abrams group and it turns out it did have a name. The name of the star was Hobus, but it was never in any of the movies. It was in a graphic novel. So if okay. we call it the Hobus timeline, every time we refer to it, we're going to have to put a little asterisk and a footnote uh. <laughs> because, uh, because how many people actually bought that graphic novel and, re and remember that detail? So we, we went... Uh, we developed a long list of well, we can call. We, we it. tried to find names. Yeah. We tried mm -hmm. to make. We tried to figure out what 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 would be logical and and so forth and so on, until we came up with the Kelvin timeline. It's one of those things. It sounds, of course, that's what you should, you should call it. But it was it was a simple answer, but it was an excruciatingly difficult process to get to that point. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, CBS was was uh, was. Was no help. Thanks, John. Um, <laughs> Nobody wanted to touch the problem because it was a problem, and yeah. but nobody wanted to solve the problem. So it kind of landed in our in our laps. And so, like I said, we went through all these names and we submitted them to John, and we said, you know, this is this is your baby. This is not our baby. Um, we, we wrote, what do you want to call it? We wrote we wrote a multi page memo saying. There's the plot, here, here's the pros and cons for each uh, for each possible name, and uh, we think it sh uh, we think the best is uh, choices uh, is the Kelvin timeline. But it's stuck. It's stuck. It's stuck because it's all over the place yeah. now. There, there, there's a Blu-ray set, the Kelvin timeline. Yeah. There's there's, yeah. A, there's 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 books out, and there, so they're they're using it. So so that's good, and it's very gratifying to know that because of the encyclopedia that was created and then it took life and it flew away. Yeah, because I think, because I guess I know anymore, like I always see prime, like prime timeline, Kelvin timeline. So now right. we know who's, who's responsible. To go back to your original question, no, I, uh, I, I, I do not see us doing more, more no, encyclopedia. We, well, well for, for a couple of reasons. Number one, it has to be fun. Mm -hmm. And so there you go. And we have to actually not do any other work because that's the work we're doing. So we have to be able to pay the mortgage and put food on the table. Right. And, and we're not working on discovery or 
a card. A card. Yeah. So when you, one of the great things that we had were scripts and we were there. Mm -hmm. And so it was um, easier. Uh, yeah. because we were part and, of the production and not being part of the production would have made it really hard. It was actually quite hard on the, uh, uh, Abrams, on films. the Abrams films because we had to, we had to understand it. There were, there are places where we'd go, we would have to play it a dozen because times. We just didn't understand. We just didn't understand what the story was trying to tell us. And we were, we were confused. So, um, that was hard. Yeah. No reflection on the story, but there are things that if, if it goes for an ordinary viewer, it's okay. You know, there's a lot yeah. of stuff happening. Right, but we had to tear it apart and make sense of it. Yeah, you kind of had to like nitpick a little bit, a little bit more to kind of, because I mean, you're, you were literally writing the book on it. Yeah, that was and hard. Th th there was one issue, I don't, I don't even remember what it was, where it just utterly didn't make sense to me. And uh, so I, I, I sent Van Sitters a kind of a snarky email. I said, look, I'm just gonna, here's what they said, I'm going to say that. <laughs> and Ben Sitter said, very diplomatically said, no, you don't understand. This is what it was. Oh, but because we weren't there, we, did, we, did, we didn't, it, it took us quite a while to, 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 understand, to understand the logic of what they were, what they had been doing. Yeah. But we got to finish, we got to finish up the shows that we worked on, which we were very mm -hmm. happy about. We were, you know, we were glad yeah. that we could do that. And, um, our friends at Harper Design did a gorgeous job. Beautiful I, I, don't know, job. I don't know if you've seen it. It's it was so, huge, two volume. It they only yeah. they didn't make that many and they're gone. I mean, they were gone. They're not reprinting it. They they no. sold out and you can find them on eBay for hundreds of dollars. Oh yeah. So um, anyway, so. Oh, we're not going to be writing any more encyclopedias. <laughs> not unless someone wants to pay us a lot, a lot of, money. of money. Exactly. Crowdfunding. So, uh, so we've talked about uh, the past a lot. Um, we didn't talk very much about the, your current project, which, which is uh, For All Mankind. Um, we are so excited about that show. Um, about a couple of years ago, uh, we got a call from Steve Oster, who was a producer on uh, on uh, Deep Space Nine. Our first day on the set, we're uh, uh, our first day of shooting. We're uh, we're sitting on set with uh, uh, with Ron Moore, and you know, we're still trying to wrap our brain around around what the show is. So he said, "Ron, explain it to us." And he told us a lot about alternate history, about uh, uh, about workplace dramas, about all all these kind of things about the characters. But then he said something that, ah, he said, this story is how you get from present day to Star Trek. Ah, I get that. Okay. It's, uh, uh, there's so much science fiction today that is bleak, that is dystopian. It's brilliant. It's wonderful stuff. But it's, uh, it, it doesn't have the joy that Star Trek did. I agree. For all mankind does. Okay. Yeah, I've... I, I've watched uh, the first several episodes. I haven't got, I haven't finished everything that's come out yet, but I really enjoy it so far. The the first season is very much rooted in um, in real space technology, and uh, it's it's a, it's a direct departure from uh, from things that actually happened, mm -hmm. especially near, near the beginning of the season. So we got to hang out in this beautiful. Uh, uh, museum quality replica of historic Apollo mission control. We got to crawl around in the command module. We got to help uh, our version of Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin fly the lunar module. We got to be on the newsroom floor when our version of Walter Cronkite is, is reporting on the first landing on the moon. Uh, which were the Russians. Which were the, which, which oh, yeah. the Russians. We got to, uh, we got to hang around in mission control during the flights of Apollo, uh, uh, Apollo 11 and 12 and 15. And then later on, later on in the season, we, we got to be there for the, uh, for the launch of Apollo 23 and the launch and the dramatic missions of Apollo's 24 and 25. So, you know, I mean, we passionately love Star Trek, but we're also big space geeks. Yeah. And um, mm -hmm. so this is like a kid in the candy store and it's really the most fun that we've had since we left Star Trek. 
Yeah. Nice. Now you guys, you guys have actually also worked directly with NASA before, correct? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And what, 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 can, can, can you tell our listeners ex exactly what you did for NASA? Designed a bunch of graphics and patches for them. Okay. Through the years of working on Star Trek, we were um, a lot of folks that work in the space program at JSC and KSC and so forth um, are big Star Trek fans. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we would have them over to, you know, when they were in California, they'd come over to Paramount and we would take them on scene uh, behind the scenes, you know, of the sets and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And um, just, you know, we, we both loved each other's universes. And so yeah. when later on, Michael was um, very happy to be able to help out and, and designed a bunch of um, patches for different departments. And then also, um, so our two universes kind of, you know. Yeah. Collide. Yeah. Collide. Yep. Overlap. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. And, it, and, it, and it's fun. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, it's, I mean it's, with with you guys' love of space, and then you finally you get to you know merge your two loves right there. Mm -hmm. And 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 in fact, uh, it overlapped a little bit into um, uh, for all mankind. At, at, at one point, you know, they're they're, um, they're they they actually have a, a full time graphic artist. His name is uh, uh, Evan Register. Does a lot of amazing work. They got crunched at one point where they, they needed uh, some su suggestions for some additional uh, mission patches. So we did a little little consulting uh, for that. So some of the fictional Apollo flights that uh, that you never saw on camera, uh, uh, we helped out with. I, I think I, I think I mentioned that we shut down production in, uh, yeah. in March because yeah. of the pandemic. But yeah. they're they're planning to restart uh, very soon. So hopefully the second season of For All Mankind was, uh, uh, will resume production. We're, the second season is 10 episodes like the first. Mm -hmm. uh, we already shot the first eight, so we're... Um, wow. you, you were close. <laughs> so we, 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 started, they, we started filming, they call them blocks, because one director directs two different... Um, two consecutive two episodes. Two consecutive episodes. Oh, so okay. nine and 10, and we started filming that block in wow. early... March, Ugh. and um, but we just shot a couple of days, mm. and everything just boom went down. But mm. uh, hopefully, in the not too distant future, for all mankind, we'll return to Apple TV Plus. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> so please take uh, take a look. It's uh, it's how it's how you get to Star Trek. That's right. <laughs> well, we're very proud of the we're very proud of the series, as you can probably tell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We're we're not we're not in the art department, so uh, so we can just walk onto those sets and just admire what the, uh, what what they've done without having without having had to sweat at all. And that's true. <laughs> the production designer on For All Mankind is a gentleman uh, named Dan Bishop. I don't know if you ever seen the uh, the series Mad Men. Oh yeah, uh, uh -huh. but uh, he was production designer on Mad Men, and he he brought that same aesthetic, that same. Attention fanatical to attention to detail. Uh, yeah. I, I can see that. Uh, you know, when I've watched uh, yeah, the no first way. couple episodes, I thought that a lot of it felt very Mad Men. So it definitely translates. Very, very much. Yeah, and, and as the show progresses, uh, if you recall, the first few episodes are set in the late '60s, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. about halfway through the season, the show uh, fast forwards to the mid '70s. And and of course the the clothing style and stylistically just, and everything it changes that that that's just so much fun. <laughs> well, this was so much fun, but we're not we're not going to keep you guys any longer. So we really want to thank you guys for coming on. We know you guys were our first like fans of the band and like this in the Star Trek world, and we're we'll never forget that. I still one of my favorite memories still from from Star Trek Star Trek Las Vegas. Is playing you guys on the under the stage with our bump, song bump Miri. On the head. Yes, see, bump bump on the head. Bump head. We love that. We love that song. I mean, it's just yeah. We, it's one of Denise's it's favorite one of my earworms. Favorite. <laughs> I just love it. Oh, well, thank you guys for coming on. We, we will gladly have you on any other time as soon as maybe even once for, for all mankind season two comes back on. You know, we can come back on and you can regale us with more Star Trek stories. <laughs>
Well, it was, working on Star Trek was a lot of fun. It was a great group of people. It was a family, and we certainly miss it. I mean, we we really, really do. I mean, uh, when Discovery came up, uh, there's a whole other story with that. We thought we were going to Toronto. Oh, my gosh. Um, but they decided to hire a company to do the graphics and we didn't go to Toronto. Because and guess what? It's, it's expensive to move people from Los Angeles yeah, to, to exactly. Toronto. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. But that worked out fine. We, we were trying to figure out how, what we were going to do with our dogs. I mean, do they yeah. sit in the apartment all day long? And they're our family. So, um, yeah. Yeah. you know, we, we didn't want to be in the snow. So we're very happy how it yeah. turned out. And it turned out fine because now we get to work on For All Mankind. That's true. Very true. Yep. yep. Another space show, at least. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, lovely talking to you guys. Um, Great talking to you guys. And, you know, keep the faith. It's going to be okay. It really will. It's going to take time. It's going to take We'll get time. there. But we will get there. And, we'll, and we're going to be fine. Blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah, blah. We have officially launched the Five Year Mission Patreon. On there, you can see posts with pictures and videos of behind the scenes shenanigans with the band and the podcast. There are different levels you can sign up for where you'll get exclusive merch and videos and unreleased tracks and demos and other stuff from the band and the podcast that you wouldn't normally get if you didn't follow us on Patreon. The different tiers you get to choose from go from Ensign all the way up to Admiral. And one of the perks of being an Admiral is that you get to be a producer on this podcast. This week's producers are Neil Carpenter, Debbie Rinke, Helen Lake, Carol Jones, Steve and Frankie Palopoli, Madison Rachel Jones, Becky and Roxy, and of course, Jim Morehouse. So head over to the Five Year Mission Patreon right now and sign up as an admiral, and your name can be listed at the end of the next episode of Five Year Mission, the podcast. Just go to patreon.com slash five year mission. That's the number five year mission. Fansets.com is your home for all things pop culture pin related. Head over to Fansets right now and you can check out new releases from DC Comics including Batman 66 as well as a new Ultraman collection. And in the continuing saga of the Women of Trek pin collection, you can check out the new Tapol and remember they also have the new Sklittery 7 of 9 pin as well as the continuing Combadge collection with a new release from Star Trek Voyager. They also have all the Picard Com badges over there, too. There's a regular full-size one. There's a mini one. It's, they're all great. You can even display them. They have displays set out for these tiny little works of art. So when you go over there and fill up your cart, enter the code 5YEARMISSION. That's the number 5, and then all caps, YEAR MISSION. You can receive 15% off of your entire order. Fansets. Our pins have character. And we thank the boys over at Fansets for continuing to sponsor this podcast and every single podcast on the Trek Geeks Network every single week. I think that went really well. Yeah. Yeah, there... Yeah. They're they're fun to talk to. Very very interesting couple. Well, it was really cool. That it sucks that we didn't have a video for this one when they showed us that binder that yeah, they I know. used for the for, for the Roddenberry vault. Because man, that thing was so thick, and there was so much tiny little writing on just the one page that he showed us. And I was like, I know. what is on those other pages? Also, uh, he showed off a bunch of those patches. And, yeah, uh, I mean, we we got to see him, but mm -hmm. well, I, I I posted a photo on our Facebook page of him, the, 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 just the shot the shot of the, the three okay. of us on the Zoom cool. call, and he's holding up that that flight operations patch. Cool. But yeah, it's 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 pretty it's pretty neat. Like I didn't realize that they were doing like that much with NASA. Yeah, I didn't either. Uh, you know, I I thought maybe they might have worked a little bit with them, but I didn't realize they were actually designing like all of their their patches and logos and and stuff that's pretty awesome 
Yeah, especially like I, I didn't realize it was like not just for like like team missions. It's just for like the if, and also for like the individual astronauts yeah. and stuff. That's so cool. Yeah, I mean, and he's a huge space geek too. Like, yeah, huge into it. Like both of them are. So it's 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 really neat to, you know, like I'm living my childhood dream. I'm working with NASA on projects. Right, like you. Not not only do you get to work on TV shows that you love about mm-hmm. exploring outer space, but then you get to work with the actual real people who explore outer space. Yeah, so cool. So neat. But, uh, yeah, uh, hopefully they'll come back sometime and we can talk more. Uh, yeah. They're they're they are full of stories. <laughs> uh huh. What I would think would be hilarious to do at some point is uh, do like TOS trivia, but have the Okudas versus Jim Morehouse. Yes. I was just Oh my God. That. <laughs> that would be, because Jim Morehouse needs to be taken down a peg when it comes to his Star Trek knowledge. And I think the one person besides like Larry Nemechek that could do it would be Mike and Denise. Yeah. I like to just refer to Mike and Denise as one person. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed that. I wasn't going to correct you. <laughs> well, because you always hear, you're, you, you never hear one without the other, really. So yeah. I, I consider them, they're, the Okudas are, an, are more of an entity than they are two separate people. Yeah. <laughs> and I love that what brought them together was Max Hedrum. <laughs> <laughs> of all of all the things max headroom so we'll see you next time <laughs> <laughs> on five year mission the podcast <laughs>Thank you for listening to this episode of Five Your Mission, the podcast. If any of you are interested in listening to more of our music, you can check us out on YouTube or Spotify or iTunes or pretty much anywhere that you can listen to music. Just search for Five Year Mission and we should be the first thing that comes up. If you would like to contact us in regards to the podcast or anything else that you want to talk to us about, you can email us at fiveyearmissionband at gmail.com. And for more information about the band, you can go to fiveyearmission.net. And also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Five Year Mission, the podcast, is a production of Coconut Media Works. Executive producers Bill Smith and Dan Davidson. For more great Star Trek discussion, discover the other shows of the Trek Geeks podcast network at trekgeeks.com or find us in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app.